Uh, so uh, today, Field and I are going to be uh, talking to you all about the review that we did, uh, looking at how uh, we talk about uh, reliability for qualitative chemistry education research uh, as a field. And our interest in this uh, area, so kind of what inspired this review, was we were really noticing the range of approaches uh, that people were taking with uh, describing how they were establishing reliability in CER articles, uh, as well as the different ways we were engaging in doing that within our own research group. We also noticed that there wasn't a similar resource about reliability in qualitative CER as there exists looking at um, reliability and validity in quantitative uh, CER. So it seems like a gap um, where it would be really nice to have a resource. So that being said, <clears throat> we view our, uh, our review article as well as our talk today um, as serving as a resource. And so our slides are going to potentially be a little bit more text heavy than we might normally do, but um, we want um, you all to be able to look at the slides later on um, and get the information you need. Uh, also, we are happy to take questions uh, at the end. <clears throat> okay. So when we started off the review, uh, we ended up, or we decided that we wanted to look across the last 10 years of CER articles uh, and in SERP and JCE. So we looked across all these different articles uh, and looked for articles that contained a qualitative education research component. Uh, and then started identifying the different ways in which people were describing establishing reliability for the qualitative research components. Uh, as we started digging into articles, though, we really realized we needed to think for ourselves kind of how we wanted to define um, and identify uh, reliability or trustworthiness a little bit more broadly. Uh, and so um, trustworthiness is important for us uh, as uh, writers of research articles uh, to describe because we've got a really broad audience uh, of readers um, of CER articles. <clears throat> and so it's important for us to be providing clear descriptions uh, so that both researchers and practitioners engaging with our articles can understand as well as interpret our analysis and the findings of our studies. So there are two primary approaches uh, described in the qualitative research literature for how we can establish uh, trustworthiness. The first is through using the <clears throat> um, what we would call a conventional approach, which derives um, very much from the kind of traditional scientific practice or approach that we learn as scientists. Uh, and this approach is made up of validity, reliability, and <clears throat> objectivity. Now, Lincoln and Guba uh, derived uh, what they called the naturalistic approach. Uh, and this approach uh, differs in that it, it doesn't assume the same type of objective reality um, that we may think of or have been trained to think of as scientists. Um, and it takes into account the fact that our our reality, our perceptions of reality um, are kind of created through our own lens as well as the fact that the participants uh, in our study are going to have um, their own view kind of of their reality. So the naturalistic approach then uh, is our establishing trustworthiness for this approach uh, is made up of um, establishing credibility, transferability, dependability, and confirmability. Now, we were interested in reliability uh, specifically, <clears throat> um, which is whether or not or how we can think about if our findings are going to be consistent. Uh, but Lincoln and Guba uh, describe uh, dependability as being uh, the kind of parallel construct to reliability under the naturalistic approach. So this is something to just keep in mind because uh, within CER, people do engage in establishing trustworthiness both through the conventional and the naturalistic approaches. So then how do we uh, go about establishing reliability uh, for CER? Uh, 
There are two primary approaches described in the qualitative and content analysis uh, literature, uh, and those are through um, inter-rater reliability and negotiated agreement. <clears throat> And we'll go into definitions for what those two are uh, in a moment. Now, for, to establish dependability, uh, Lincoln and Guba describe uh, four different approaches. Um, the first three uh, that they mention, um, they describe as not directly addressing the idea of dependability. Uh, so what they propose then instead uh, is that researchers engage in an inquiry audit to directly address uh, dependability. So again, I'm not going to go over everything on the slides, um, but this serves here uh, as a resource um, if you want to go back and look at what that is. Um, so we are then really focused on the considerations um, that we as researchers uh, in chemistry education take to establish reliability. Um, the first consideration is thinking about the, the process whereby we want to establish reliability. So whether that be through using an inter rater reliability measure uh, or going through a process of negotiated agreement. <coughs> uh, then um, we also have some considerations we need to take uh, as we are beginning to engage in the data analysis process um, that help us think about which of uh, these ways of establishing reliability we want to engage in. Uh, <clears throat> now with that being said, uh, it's really up to the researcher to decide which approach uh, is the most appropriate um, for demonstrating uh, trustworthiness uh, for their research. Uh, and so we don't mean to uh, discredit any other ways for establishing trustworthiness. Um, but irrespective of the method whereby researchers do this, uh, it is important for us to clearly describe the methods that we're engaging with to establish reliability or trustworthiness more generally. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, what is reliability then? Um, and Krippendor uh, describes two different definitions uh, for reliability, but what is key here uh, is that we want to think about reliability as showing that uh, our analysis will respond to the same phenomena in the same way, uh, and this idea of a community agreeing on the interpretations um, of our data analysis. So as I mentioned, there are two different primary approaches that are described in the content analysis literature. Uh, the first is through using inter-rater reliability, uh, and in this, we have a quantitative measure that shows the consistency with which two or more researchers are able to apply uh, codes to the same units of data as they um, go through analysis. The second approach then <clears throat> is negotiated agreement. Uh, and here, two or more researchers will code the entire uh, subset or the entire data uh, source they have uh, and go through a negotiation process about the codes that have been applied to that data. And now I'm going to turn it over to Field. Yeah, so thank you, Soler, for that framing. Um, so yeah, so now we'll start going through uh, some of the considerations uh, before beginning analysis, and then we'll get into some more of the details specifically about uh, calculating specific types of IRR measures and demonstrating uh, reliability through those measures or negotiated agreement. Uh, so first, the considerations sort of before doing the analysis, uh, and the first thing you want to think about specifically is the data type that you're working with. Um, so from our own experience with our own research projects and in our review of the literature, interviews appear to be kind of the most common uh, or, or one of the most common approaches uh, for qualitative research. Um, but as Catherine mentioned earlier in our introductions, uh, we've also done a, quite a bit of research focused on analyzing writing assignments. So you can imagine how these data sources look differently and how that can naturally influence uh, both the goals of the research, but also how you might need to go about establishing reliability for the analysis. Um, and then there are also a variety of other 
types of data analysis that, or data types that you might see in the literature or imagine uh, working with. Um, so we can think about earlier in the present or earlier in MICER this morning where we saw people doing different types of uh, data collection and data analysis and you might want to think about how those are going to shape all of the further uh, directions. Um, so right now uh, we'd like to do just a quick thing where you can respond in the chat and sort of think about type out the types of qualitative data that you might uh, have experience with or that you might uh, imagine working with someday just so we can start thinking about the different data types that we're all working with. Yeah, so I'm looking through in the chat, I see observations and focus groups, uh, some interview transcripts, so those are pretty common, uh, survey responses, looking at things that students are drawing. Yeah, so there are a variety of data types so um, that we're all familiar with or that we all might be working with in different ways. So yeah, so now that we are sort of thinking about the different data types, um, it's important then to think about how we can take those data types and define units of analysis. Um, so units of analysis then are uh, essentially just the, the units that you're applying codes to in the data analysis process. Uh, so these are typically dependent on both the data type itself and the goals of the analysis. Uh, so some considerations when thinking about the units um, are first that they're useful for facilitating the agreement and discussion process uh, whenever you are going through and analyzing data. Um, and units of analysis specifically are necessary uh, for calculating the specific IRR measures that we'll be going through in a moment. Um, and then also at this stage it's important to think about if you uh, can apply multiple codes to any single unit of analysis. Uh, so we can see over here some different examples of potential units of analysis for the types of data that Solaire and I are familiar with. Um, so for example, whenever you're analyzing interviews, uh, one method that we've done before has been dividing into units of meaning. Um, and these are essentially based around the, the interview questions in the protocol uh, wrapped up with the different probing questions for the specific main questions in the interview protocol and using those as a predefined unit uh, for the analysis process. So then another important consideration that you want to think about uh, before developing or deciding IRR measures or consensus process that you might be doing is the reliability subsample. So this is essentially just the fraction of data that you're coding um, during the process of establishing reliability or developing a coding scheme. Uh, so, for, so again, this is inherently tied to the amount of data that you might have and the type of data that you're collecting. Um, and it's important uh, for the reliability subsample to decide whether you intend to report reliability measures or uh, an agreement process for a portion or part of the data. Um, so in the literature, there's no specific recommendations for um, developing the coding scheme and how to divide the data that you have in that process. Uh, but from our experience, we have found that proceeding in 5% increments can be effective for coding scheme development. Um, and I see uh, Anna's question in the chat, and I think that this particularly applies whenever uh, developing uh, uh, an, a coding scheme um, can be useful to think about the reliability subsample particularly when developing the coding scheme instead of using a coding scheme that's already been developed. Um, so then again, we can see over here some examples um, how this can be inherently tied to how much data you have and the type of data. So next, we'll go into some of the agreement measures. Um, and these are all reflective of the agreement measures that Solaire and I identified in our uh, review. Uh, broadly grouped into percent agreement, correlation coefficients, and chance-corrected agreement coefficients. 
Um, so now if uh, Catherine could share the poll that we put together um, asking about which agreement measures you might be familiar with uh, or that you have used in your research. And I'll give everyone a moment to respond to that poll. Yep, should be in chat. Yeah, so I'll let more responses come in. Uh, it looks like most people are familiar, or the majority are familiar with percent agreement uh, and then correlation coefficients coming in a close second. Uh, a number of people familiar with some of the negotiated agreement processes. Um, so yeah, so I think these results here uh, are somewhat reflective of uh, what Solaire and I saw in the literature, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, but for now, we'll just go through and sort of describe conceptually some of the measures themselves. Um, I'll say here, I'll reiterate what Solaire mentioned earlier. There's a lot on these slides uh, because we do want these to be a resource after the presentation. Um, and, and then I'll also say the focus here is more on the different usages and um, limitations of these different types of uh, measures rather than the actual details of how to calculate them, uh, but we will share resources uh, for how to calculate them at the end of the presentation. Um, so percent agreement is uh, what it sounds like. It's, a, it's just a straightforward measure of the proportion of observed agreement whenever you're applying coding, the coding theme of two researchers. Um, so one of the key things to note about percent agreement is that there's a general agreement within the content analysis uh, literature that is not necessarily an appropriate measure um, of reliability itself. And this is because it doesn't account for uh, variance in coding or chance agreement between researchers. Um, so while I do think it is a useful measure, uh, because it's rather straightforward to interpret, um, it is important to note that it's not necessarily appealing to the notion of reliability itself. Um, there are a few limitations though with percent agreement uh, in that there are certain situations uh, listed here that can be a little more difficult to calculate. Um, with that said, however, there are uh, some extensions that uh, work around some of these limitations, uh, such as Holstie's method, whenever researchers are coding different units. Uh, the next sort of general class of measures are correlation coefficients. Um, so these essentially account for the covariation between uh, two researchers' application of codes. Uh, and you might be familiar specifically with Pearson's R, um, which measures the degree of linearity um, and is essentially the same value that we calculate, like the R squared value uh, that we calculate whenever determining a line of best fit um, for linear data. Uh, so in terms of the usage, uh, Pearson's R is one of the more commonly used correlation coefficients. Um, however, uh, it's generally not necessarily recommended for inter-rater reliability itself, uh, because it measures the degree of linearity rather than agreement. Uh, so for example, you can imagine whenever there is systematic disagreement between two researchers, uh, for example, if they're scoring uh, documents on a rubric, if one researcher consistently scores it, scores a response five points higher, then you can get a, a linear relationship uh, that has zero disagreement. Uh, so because of that, it's not necessarily recommended for IRR itself. Um, and then again, there are some limitations with uh, correlation coefficients and the data type that they are applied for and that they do not account for agreement by chance. Uh, and then we will mention that there are a few extensions that overcome in particular the uh, idea that uh, Pearson's R doesn't account for agreement itself. Um, so both interclass correlation coefficients and lens concordance correlation coefficient are two extensions um, 
that are generally re recommended as more appropriate IRR measures um, if correlation coefficients make sense for the type of data and analysis that you're doing. Uh, so then going into the chance corrected agreement coefficients, uh, these account for the expected degree of agreement by chance uh, by calculating the proportion of expected agreement and comparing that to the observed agreement. Um, so there are two common chance corrected agreement coefficients uh, commonly used in the CER literature. Uh, there are others, but we are just going to focus on these two uh, because they're more well known. Uh, so first there's Cohen's kappa, which was developed specifically to account for uh, distribution differences in the distributions of codes, uh, but there are a number of limitations reported in the literature for Cohen's kappa. And then there's also Kripendorf's alpha, which uh, was developed uh, mostly to account for these limitations that are present in Cohen's kappa. Uh, and the one thing to note with the chance corrected agreement coefficients is that they can have both negative and positive values, uh, where zero indicates that the observed agreement is equal to agreement by chance, uh, and the negative values are less than expected by chance, agreement and positive values indicate a agreement beyond chance. Uh, so then Cohen's kappa specifically um, is commonly used in a generally accepted measure, uh, but we did want to go into some of the key limitations and then different extensions that have been developed uh, for Cohen's kappa. Uh, so in particular, the Cohen's kappa itself is limited in the type of data that it can be applied to. Uh, however, there are extensions like weighted kappa that allow for different types of uh, analysis. Uh, Cohen's kappa is also limited to only two researchers applying codes, uh, but there are extensions like Fleiss's kappa and Light's kappa that allow for more than two researchers to be involved in the IRR process. Um, another limitation of kappa is that it requires only one code uh, can be allowed per unit of analysis, uh, but there have been recent, the recent development of fuzzy kappa, which can allow researchers to apply multiple codes per unit of analysis. Um, and then the last key limitation uh, for Cohen's kappa is that it uh, doesn't handle uh, situations where the distribution of codes is skewed. Uh, so for instance, when one code is applied much less frequently than another code, then kappa tends to uh, be much lower and does not accurately affect or reflect the agreement. Uh, and for this, there is GWET's AC1 metric that accounts for this limitation. Um, and then going into Kripendorf's alpha, this is another uh, chance corrected agreement measure that avoids many of those limitations uh, that require the different extensions for Cohen's kappa. Um, I will say here the formula that you, that is shown in the literature for Kripendorf's alpha looks a bit different than the other chance corrected agreement uh, measures, but it, it, it is conceptually the same formula. It's just typically represented in terms of disagreements rather than agreements. Um, so like I said, it's a commonly used and generally accepted IRR measure, and it can be used for a variety of types of data analysis. Um, and it's also uh, suitable for small reliability subsample sizes, which is a consideration that uh, was not specifically addressed in the different descriptions that we read about the other measures. Uh, so with that, I will let Soler take it over and get into some ideas about negotiated agreement. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so negotiated agreement is this kind of is the secondary uh, category category with which um, the content analysis literature describes uh, approaching reliability. Uh, and in negotiated agreement, uh, researchers would still go undergo that standard process of developing a coding scheme through iterative coding of subsets of the data and discussing discrepancies uh, in the coding to help refine the coding scheme. Uh, but following that, then two or more researchers would apply the coding scheme to the full data set uh, and then compare their codes and discuss to negotiate any differences in how they applied the codes. There are two ways uh, that have been described for going through negotiated agreement. Um, the first is the consensus approach. Uh, and in this approach, uh, researchers come to complete consensus on all of the codes that are applied to the data, so resolving all of the discrepancies. The second approach uh, we've termed Campbell's approach, um, 
because it's described in the Campbell article uh, cited at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and here, Campbell argues that researchers can leave some of the coding disagreements unresolved, um, particularly if those coding disagreements might indicate something interesting about that specific uh, unit or piece of data. But that if uh, researchers are using this approach, um, they should then report an inter-rater agreement value uh, that indicates the um, final agreement they were able to reach on application uh, of the code so that the readers um, can under can know kind of overall what level of agreement was reached. Now negotiated agreement can be used uh, on its own uh, or it can be paired with an IRR measure. Uh, and uh, the uh, content analysis literature uh, describes uh, that uh, using uh, an IRR measure or calculating IRR measure can be useful for determining if negotiated agreement should be used. Uh, so if a, a high R IRR measure or value is calculated, then that might indicate that one researcher can code the remaining data, uh, whereas if a low IRR value uh, is obtained following finalization of the coding scheme that a uh, negotiated agreement should be used for the remaining data. Uh, one limitation of negotiated agreement is that it doesn't align with the traditional notion of reliability uh, and so that's where pairing it with an IRR measure can also be very helpful. However, negotiated agreement can be useful in reducing any potential researcher subjectivity uh, in coding, uh, as well as reducing the potential for coding errors that might arise when working with complex or dense data. So uh, using IRR measures or negotiated agreement are the two primary modes uh, described in uh, the literature. Um, for establishing reliability, um, but in our review of CER articles, we found a few other approaches that people were using. So I wanted to outline those briefly here. Uh, the first kind of subset of uh, approaches that we saw was where researchers were involving multiple coders uh, in developing the, the coding scheme, and they described this um, as their way of establishing the reliability of the scheme. Uh, and in this, the researchers would often reach consensus for the portion of the data uh, that they were coding to uh, refine the coding scheme, um, but then a single researcher would code the remaining data um, without uh, also then using an IRR measure uh, type of calculation. Uh, researchers then also generally reported uh, establishing trustworthiness more broadly. The two primary ways they discussed uh, doing this uh, were through discussions with researchers as they were working to, um, to develop the coding scheme um, and throughout the analysis process, uh, as well as using triangulation across multiple data sources. Um, but we did also see people discussing using member checking uh, and discussing with outside researchers to establish the trustworthiness uh, of their analysis. Um, but these do not directly address uh, this idea of dependability as Lincoln and Guba describe it. So we'll go back to our graph uh, here, looking at the way that people discussed reliability across the last 10 years of CER articles. Uh, and what we can take from this is that um, the number of articles where, or the fraction of articles that are describing uh, establishing reliability in some way is generally increasing uh, within our field. We focus then uh, more specifically on the articles published between 2017 to 2019. Uh, and here we looked uh, at each of the qualitative data sources to see how people describe establishing reliability. I think our uh, results um, kind of highlighted here 
seem to align some with um, your responses to the poll that we had earlier, where we saw that people were most often describing using percent agreement uh, and consensus to establish reliability. Um, and then also worth noting is that our two chance corrected agreement measures, Cohen's Kappa and Krippendorf's Alpha, um, were only used in total about uh, about 20% um, of the data sources, um, potentially somewhat more mixed in with our multiple measures and measures with consensus. Now we also wanted to uh, demonstrate and establish the reliability for our own coding. Uh, of the articles. So I've got our coding scheme up here uh, and to uh, establish our own reliability uh, we applied the coding scheme to a random sample of 20% of our data set uh, and then we calculated percent agreement, Cohen's Kappa, and Krippendorf's Alpha because we wanted to be able to compare uh, across the three. So you can see that the values we got do indicate a moderate agreement that would be acceptable for tentative uh, conclusions. Uh, but the values do also indicate that as a field, we may want to think about how we can more clearly report uh, establishing reliability in CER articles. And so one example is that we saw people um, placing both reliability information in the methods as well as in the results uh, section. We then uh, underwent a process of negotiated agreement for our remaining data set uh, and discussed any discrepancies to reach consensus. I'm going to hand it back over to Field to finish us off. Yeah, so now I'll just go through sort of some of the key points and implications um, from our review and just what we have just presented. Uh, so as Solar mentioned, uh, there is a trend towards incorporating more discussion of reliability in CER articles. Um, however, it is important to note that a third of the articles do not discuss, uh, from what we could tell, reliability or trustworthiness. Um, so uh, Solar and I recommend that we should continue to make an effort uh, within the field uh, to continue this positive shift towards more discussions of trustworthiness and reliability. Um, and then. Alongside that, there's also been an increased use of the different IRR measures and negotiated agreement processes, uh, at least reported within the CER articles. Um, however, uh, we should note that many uh, researchers are, st are reporting percent agreement alone, um, and it's important just to note that within the content analysis literature, um, how reporting percent agreement alone is often criticized um, as not necessarily being an appropriate measure for reliability uh, because it doesn't account for uh, chance agreement or the distribution of, of the different researchers' uh, application of codes. Um, and so with this said, uh, we think it, it can be useful for researchers to um, note the different appropriateness and uses uh, for the specific IRR measures uh, when reporting them and to consider the, the wide range of IRR, IRR measures and processes that are uh, reported out there in the qualitative analysis and content analysis um, literature, uh, which we have just reviewed, um, because there are a variety of limitations associated with different measures and each type of process is suited for different types of data and different um, analyses. Um, so it's just important to note the different limitations and usages uh, to determine what makes the most sense for the project or analysis that you are doing. Uh, and then the last key point um, is the idea about uh, how discussions of reliability can be difficult to identify. Um, and this um, was noted in the previous slide where Solaire showed our approach um, for coding students' response, or for coding the different um, articles included in our analysis. Um, and for this approach, uh, we worked on um, additionally using negotiated agreement along with reliability measures. Um, so with this, uh, Soleil and I recommend um, describing and reporting steps to demonstrate reliability or trustworthiness um, within research articles um, so that it is clear that the researchers are attending to these um, constructs. Um, 
So I think we had planned a short breakout room to discuss um, some of the questions that are actually, I think, in the chat. Um, so I don't know if there's actually time, Catherine, to do the breakout rooms with the next session coming up. Um, we're, we're a little short on time. Would you be willing instead to answer the questions in the chat? Because there's been quite a few cracking ones come up. Yes, let me look. Um, so you should be aware that you can flag comments with questions, I think. Uh, somebody asked quite early on if you could say something about how this applies to inductive versus deductive. And also a question on how would this work if you didn't have a second researcher? Yeah, so so I do think that the, uh, uh, I think we addressed briefly the, the idea of inductive versus deductive coding um, and the different roles that these types of reliability measures might play with that. Um, and then with the idea of a second researcher, um, I think that's where these other types of uh, approaches towards demonstrating trustworthiness can be useful, um, particularly discussions um, with outside researchers that you might meet at conferences like this, um, or even discussions with instructors or other people within your department who might have an interest in uh, the type of research you're doing. Um, I'm um, going to add to that in yeah. that we did see some people reporting that they actually engaged in inter-rater or intra-rater reliability where they came back to their data and coded a subset um, after a certain period of time had passed. So this is where I think that clearly describing what you're doing can be useful so that um, researchers recognize that or readers recognize that you are a single researcher and so you had to take this other approach. Uh, also comment briefly, I, I, I really appreciate um, Anna Anna's comments here about sort of the positivist approach uh, that that is inherent with reliability measures. Um, and we do agree that uh, it's not necessarily always appropriate uh, for qualitative research. Uh, so that's why we emphasize that it really does depend on sort of the goals of the research and uh, what types of uh, research questions you're asking and what type of data you're working with. Um, and I think our motivation for doing this is primarily um, in that people are attending to reliability in some way uh, in the CER literatures, and we think it's an important discussion uh, to discuss both uh, this positivist approach and, and where reliability fits within that and uh, thinking as a field, um, what types of ways to establish trustworthiness are useful um, for the research that we are doing. Fantastic. Um, now, did you see the question or have you addressed already from Jackie, further up, would you be able to elaborate on why Krippendorf specifically is good for small reliability subsamples? Yeah, so so from my understanding with uh, Krippendorf's description, it's it's in how uh, the the calculation is done. Uh, so I I don't remember all the details of the calculation. It's it's a bit more of a complicated calculation than uh, Cohen's kappa for calculating the expected agreement, uh, and just because of that. Um, the specifics of the calculation uh, is why he recommends that it is suitable for the smaller subsamples. Okay, any other questions from anyone? Look, Gertrude, can I ask my question? Yeah, we got a hand up. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So uh, I just wanted to understand, uh, it's more a clarificated question, what is this expected agreement or expected disagreement in Cohen's cup and uh, Krippendorf's cup? Yeah, so so they're calculated in different ways for the two different measures, and that's where the, the differences are or in terms of how the expected agreement are calculated. Um, Essentially, it looks at the distribution of the applied codes and uses those probabilities to determine uh, the likelihood of a researcher applying a code uh, by chance, essentially. Um, so, so it uses those in slightly different ways. And like I said, in my opinion, in more complicated ways for Krippendorf's alpha um, to determine what the expected agreement would be. And I think, yeah, we have these various resources on the next slide. Um, that we can point to for the more specific details on these calculations. 
Um, so, so our advanced article in SERP cites all of these as well, um, along with more detailed descriptions of the different measures. Uh, and then we can also point to some of these more specific citations within that manuscript um, that guided our uh, analysis. Okay, and I think uh, Maya, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, wonderful presentation. Really enjoyed this. I have a question about negotiated agreements, um, specifically about consensus approach. So from my understanding about the consensus approach, you're reaching to 100% agreement because you are discussing every case of disagreement. So something you mentioned is that it can be used alone or paired with IRR measures. So my question is, do you really need to pair it with IRR measure when you're literally discussing every single case of disagreement because then you're achieving 100% agreement. So I would imagine you don't need that, that kind of measure or, or maybe I'm wrong. So I'll be happy to hear what you think about that. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, so for that then, what, what you would, I'm trying to get to that slide, what you would report is the IRR measure um, that you'd calculated for a subset of your data analysis. So, for example, the way that, like I said, that Field and I did it uh, was we calculated the, the three IRR measures for 20, that first 20% of our data that we coded. Um, and so that showed us kind of the general level of uh, reliability of our coding scheme. <clears throat> Uh, followed by which then we talked about all the disagreements we had in that 20%, coded the remaining 80%, and then talked about any disagreements in that remaining 80%. Um, yeah, and so this is, I think, pairing it with an IRR measure is going to be somewhat up to the researchers if they think that that will be beneficial to their uh, data analysis. Uh, we do a lot of work with writing, like long pieces of writing, and that can be tricky to uh, code thoroughly without, you know, missing things that students are writing about. And so I know I like to engage in uh, the consensus approach myself, um, but have found reviewers wanting an IRR measure uh, to be paired with that. Thank you. 